Good afternoon and good morning to all who are able to join us today. I hope you're healthy and safe. I'm uh, Stephen Grubbs. I'm the Vice President of Clinical Affairs at the American Society of Clinical Oncology, and I welcome you to uh, the ASCO Global Webinar Series entitled Cancer Care Experiences and Lessons During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Today's uh, topics will include prioritizing the management of cancer patients during this pandemic and strategies to minimize risk to staff from this COVID-19 disease. Next slide, please. So this series has been set up as a weekly webinar at 8 a.m. Eastern time in the United States every Tuesday. The sessions will last from 45 to 60 minutes, and we are planning to run this series through May 5th with decisions at that time whether to proceed to a longer uh, number of sessions and able to meet new demands during this difficult time. These webinars will be recorded and will be posted on the webinar series page for those that are unable to join us live. The recordings are usually posted approximately 24 hours after each live session. Next slide, please. So joining me today is Doug Pyle, our Vice President at ASCO of our International Affairs Department, who will be uh, speaking to us at the end of this presentation. And the, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Abdul Rahman Jazzi, Chairman of the Department of Oncology at the King Abdul Aziz Medical Center in Rehad, Saudi Arabia, act as our moderator today. He will be doing the heavy lifting for this uh, presentation. Next slide. Now, the presentations and answers to questions about COVID-19 presented on this webinar are provided by the American Society of Clinical Oncology uh, for voluntary informational use by providers. The information is not intended to substitute for independent professional judgment of the treating provider in the context of treating an individual patient or developing practice policies and procedures. There will be a brief question and answer after each section. If you wish to answer, ask a question, please post it in the WebEx question and answer box on your screen. In the past, we found that there are more questions than we're usually able to address. So we incorporate questions and feedback received into our respective coronavirus resource pages on the ASCA website. So that leads to our first brief uh, presentation. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce Tom Oliver, who's the Division Director of Guidelines and Measures in ASCO's Policy and Advocacy Department to tell us about quickly the ASCO Coronavirus Oncology Resource Center. Tom, welcome. Thank you, Steve, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to quickly introduce the ASCO Resource Center and outline some of the points that uh, you, you may find that this resource is a helpful source of information for you as you care for your patients. We're hoping that we've gone about it a little bit differently from other sites and, and uh, just a brief walkthrough. Uh, next slide. Oh, no, this slide is perfect. Uh, so you can, as you see, access our resource uh, page directly from the main ASCO website along the gray bar or uh, the tile down lower. Uh, and what's a little different from this resource center is it's, the content is primarily generated from user submitted questions, uh, along with other content that we feel would be useful for uh, users, but mostly from the information needs of, of people who are submitting us questions is our content. We update on an ongoing basis. Internally, we work on it every day, uh, but updates uh, occur uh, as needed, as more questions come in, as new evidence is identified, or as existing content is reviewed, and we review all the content on an ongoing basis to make sure none of that has changed, especially as we link out. Uh, we assembled a rapid response team of ASCO staff across several departments to uh, ensure as smooth and a rapid response mechanism as possible. We uh, also searched the peer review literature for any evidence to help support our content development. And we have a host of uh, volunteers who have graciously uh, donated their time and expertise in helping us 
develop this resource center content. So we're trying to take as rigorous an approach as, as possible. We've also added a new resource in the form of pre-publications uh, from ASCO journals to help get important information, especially around uh, disease-specific guidance that uh, groups and organizations, institutions are, are uh, finding from oh. their experience and generating uh, uh, important content from that. So we want to get it out into the public domain as soon as possible. Uh, next slide, please. So here's the Resource Center uh, uh, main content page. Uh, as you can see, we sorted the content into themes, uh, and uh, we have staff from uh, our policy, advocacy, guidelines, clinical affairs, and patient information, uh, all contributing to the Resource Center with the help of our content experts. Uh, the first tile, uh, provides patient care information as well as links to patient information through uh, cancer.net where we host a blog. Uh, we provide content for a, a blog for patients as well. Most of the content in this tile revolves around how to care for patients in the face of COVID and this includes that uh, disease-specific pre-publication content that I was referring to from our ASCO journals. Uh, we also uh, point to other important resources. Instead of uh, regurgitating them on our website, we'll point to the CDC or the WHO uh, or other specialist societies that uh, may have important resources listed and, and no need to uh, duplicate those. So this is uh, quite active and it's updated often, so be sure to check back uh, quite a bit. We also have information for providers and practices, uh, including information on the webinar series here. Uh, and this uh, <clears throat> tile addresses such information as allocation and, and center preparedness. The um, uh, ever-changing situation uh, has impacted our meetings and our program uh, updates, so we want to have access for folks uh, to have the most up-to-date information on these meetings, including the annual meetings, so you can access that information uh, through that tile. On the policy tile, there's a, a variety of resources from ASCO, federal agencies, and state health department, listed for quick links to rapidly changing information, so you can check in there. Um, uh, we also have introduced a COVID-19 registry uh, that is collecting data on cancer and COVID-19 outcomes. So you can access information about that registry from that tile. Um, we have a community forum for ASCO members to share information in a more informal venue uh, in, in a way that uh, we wouldn't <clears throat> add to our resource center, but it's a more free-flowing discussion uh, uh, environment. The uh, final tile is for question submission, uh, and as I mentioned, this is where we get the bulk of our content uh, ideas. We look at new questions every day and sort them into their themes, uh, and then if we need to revise or create new content, we do so. So we encourage your submissions and work to get them done, <laughs> addressed as quickly and accurately as possible. Some take a bit longer than others, given the, the nature of the difficulty, but we do get to them and we make sure we resolve each question as either already addressed or as uh, needing new content to be addressed. So I think that's about it. We encourage lots of submissions. Come visit the Resource Center for your information needs. Uh, expect to see changes to the site as content is added over time. And we hope you find this resource helpful. Please submit your questions. So thank you very much. And Dr. Jay-Z, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Tom. And thank you, Stephen, Stephen for setting up uh, the ground for the first um, ASCO Global Webinar, and it's my honor actually to moderate it. So we have um, two distinguished uh, speakers who are accomplished uh, oncologists by their own rights, but over the last few weeks they uh, accumulated massive experience of the COVID-19 uh, management due to the pandemic that we are all aware of. And they are graciously uh, agreed to share um, their experience with our uh, audience. I would like to thank uh, our 
audience, those who are watching us live, and uh, those who are uh, going to watch the recording later. So I'm, I'm going to start right away without delay introducing our first speaker, actually. I will not mention all their, uh, list all their accomplishments. You will have uh, access to their CV on the website. I'll just uh, briefly introduce, introduce them and then um, let them go with the uh, presentation. The presentation will be 10 minutes. Then the second speaker will come in five minutes and we'll have a 10 minutes question answer from the participants so you can submit your question um, uh, you know, online. So our first uh, speaker will be uh, Prof. Jesus Garcia Fonseca, um, who is the director of the University Cancer Institute and Department of Oncology at the Autonomous University of uh, Madrid. Hi. And he is uh, a member of uh, the ECHO Foundation. Uh, he will be sharing his experience about prioritizing management of cancer patients during COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Dr. Fonsias. Milan. Thank you very much for your time presentation. Thank you very much for asking us to participate as panelists in this session. We had the opportunity of sharing our own experience during these hard weeks treating cancer patients COVID positive. Next one, please. Uh, next one, please. So, first of all, COVID-19 is a highly transmissible viral illness. A diagnosis of cancer on therapy are particularly vulnerable to viral infections. Usually, cancer patients are characterized by older ages, multiple complicated diseases, a very significant comorbidity, and a lower immunity, meaning a higher probability of severe illness and increased mortality compared with the healthy population owns infected with COVID. Next one, please. So according to recently published data, there was no increase in incidence of COVID-19 infection in cancer patients, but cancer patients had a higher incidence of severe events. We need to adapt some measurements. Patients must stay at home and minimize outdoor activities. In our outpatient, our strategy has been designed to reduce the number of hospital visits. Most of the activities are arranged online in our institutions, such as appointment scheduling and monitoring visits. <laughs> instruction on medication taking and cancer-related symptom management. We can nurse all our team. We are more using video calls. We have to carry out lab testing and imaging assessment in external facilities to reduce the visit to hospital and to arrange a video consultations and we had to reduce dramatically hospital visits. In case of admissions, we need to define different parts and separate circuits for cancer patients, COVID positive, and COVID negative. In all cases, personal protective measures are required, including uh, facial max and gloss for patients. But now they don't need. PPE is strongly recommended the continuous use of disinfectant solutions, and obviously, visits are completely prohibited. And next slide, please. So, we had to pay attention very carefully to any COVID related symptoms in our cancer patients. Symptoms like fever and cough must be recorded. So in case of any suspected symptom, mandatory routine blood test must include LDH, troponin, D-dimer, ferritin, lymphocytin 6. It's as well very recommended to carry out high-resolution CT scan of the lungs. Obviously, all these patients must be tested using nucleic acid amplification tests and in case of a positive results, serological analysis is clearly recommended. Next slide, please. 
So the most important message we need to keep clear should be to personalize the risk benefit ratio for each cancer patient. Initially, all cancer patients could be stratified according to the therapy intention between curative or palliative and as well regarding life expectancy. In case of chemotherapy, we know we need to know exactly the neutropenia related risk and the potential clinical benefit versus the infection risk. Some settings like hepatological malignancy require very aggressive therapy with high risk of neutropenia. In case of this intense chemotherapy, CSF must be administered. On the other hand, the benefit of any neabsorbent or absorbent therapy should be taken into account versus a maintenance regimen, where stop and go could be an option and oral drugs are preferred instead in frabinous ones. In patients treated with targeted therapies, the use of some immunosuppressive options like CDK inhibitors must be carefully considered. And what's happened about the immunotherapy? So in immunotherapy, we should discontinue treatment in patients with any previous immunorelated event. Four-week regimen must be selected instead two weeks, any two weeks regimen. In case of COVID with rapid respiratory deterioration, we have to consider any anti interleukin 6 therapy. Next slide, please. So, radiation therapy is a mainstay in cancer therapy. If radiotherapy is delivered for cure treatment, must be started at the earliest opportunity. Radiotherapy must be selected instead of concurrent chemoradiations. If any alternative options based on the disease biology is available, such as endocrine therapy, in breast cancer or in prostate cancer, then deferring radiation therapy. Next slide, please. So, early cancer patients should be considered at a very high risk. Barrier measures should be even more drastic. Max wearing, hand washing, children avoided in the environment, hospital admission either for inpatient care or clinical visits should be avoided. There is currently an increasing public debate about the ethical dilemma of whether intubation should be offered to the older population. However, in our experience, the experience of ICU teams highlights the need to estimate the benefit risk ratio of providing ventilations to even fit older cancer patients. Next slide, please. So what happened about clinical trials? Our clinical research activity has been struggled with the outbreak. So sponsor should consider a risk assessment to modify ongoing trial and consider measures such as converting physical visits to remote visits postponing as well or canceling some visits. We need at least to consider transfer or participant in clinical trial to alternative study sites and doing study assessment at other centers to ensure participant safety. Risk assessment by the sponsor should be documented. Our priority must be patient safety and data validity. So consent needs to be reobtained, and it can be obtained using other different means. Uh, for instance, phone call or video call with email confirmation. It needs potential candidate to be recruited in any clinical trial. Individualized decision must be carefully taken. In the Basel workup currently, SARS-CoV-2 testing must be included. In any clinical trial ongoing, COVID testing must be done to identify positive patients. And in case of a positive test, 
the patient must be on hold until a negative results. Obviously, different words and separate circuits. Even obviously for patients in clinical trial should be arranged in our institutions. Uh, this one, okay, perfectly. So uh, let me do so here. Uh, what happens about uh, in our own experience? So obviously, uh, something that we need currently is to define what happened about uh, our own spend. We had 237 cancer patients with suspected symptoms. It means with fever and or with a cough. For all these patients, so we have seen clearly that we have uh, 83 positive patients. For all these patients, uh, 36 were cured, since, uh, became negative, but 47 required admission. 65 persons, more than 65 persons, lasting more than two weeks. And the COVID specific mortality was 17 percent higher than in non cancer populations. Next slide, please. So, if we take a look at about the admission rate in cancer COVID patients, according to the line of therapy, in the metastatic setting, you can see that we have more of the patients in later lines of therapy, third line and fourth lines. 28% uh, patients in second line and clearly 24% uh, patients treated in first line. Next slide, please. What happened about the admission rate according to the type of therapy, including non-metastatic setting and as well metastatic setting. So you can see that the most of the patients that had required admission were has been treated with chemotherapy, 56%, 24% targeted therapy, and 20% were being treated with immunotherapy. Obviously, it's a very short clinical series, and obviously we need to uh, include more patients and as well further analysis to clarify the role and the impact of COVID in our cancer patients. Next one, please. So what happened about our patients and our health personnel? So we need to think about that. We need uh, to prioritize our personal, our personal uh, health personnel. In, in case, obviously, we need to think that currently we need to test all our cancer patients, and obviously, we need to clarify what the status of COVID in our health personnel. But in case of no option of testing our cancer patients, our cancer patients, we need to consider any patient as potential positive in case of any suspected symptom like fever or like cough. So, and obviously, in case of any potential positive COVID patients, we need to recommend clearly use personal protective equipment for any health personnel in contact with these patients. So, uh, obviously, something that we need to recommend and to emphasize the need of testing patients for COVID. What happened about health personnel that it's clearly our priority? So currently, we are testing all our health personnel in our institutions. And we need to pay attention specifically to any symptoms, and we need to repeat COVID testing periodically. 
And obviously, in case of any symptoms in any of our health professionals, it's mandatory to retest this health professional. And in case of any positive tear test, even without symptoms, hold on isolation until negative tests. And in this uh, setting, obviously, we will monitor the health professional weekly until to be uh, negative, the result. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, probably we can summarize the main message about these presentations in these five values. So, the first one is we need to encourage a very active testing policy to identify patients and health personnel COVID positive as soon as possible. Obviously, any patients require a very individualized decisions considering the great, the risk benefit that we can provide in terms of what could be much benefit for the patients, to treat patients or the risk of infection. So obviously, this decision must be <clears throat> done like a consensus decisions within a multidisciplinary <clears throat> a multidisciplinary uh, team and discuss obviously with the patients and share with the patients our health personal is our priority <clears throat> and we need to pay attention to any symptoms. It means that periodic testing in professional in continuous care of infected patients should be performed and obviously currently so we should encourage an international collaboration in order to work together for the good of our patients and our teams sharing experience that allow us to improve and enrich the way we work in this new scenario thank you for your attention Uh, thank you, Dr. Francias, for this uh, nice uh, presentation of the experience and the recommendation. We would like to hear from our uh, uh, second expert, Dr. Gossip Corelliano, who is the clinical director of the Division of Early Drug Development and Innovative Therapy and co-chair of Cancer Experimental Therapeutics in the Department of Oncology and Hematology Oncology and University of Milan in the European Institute of Oncology. Gossip, what do you have about, uh, any comments up to, to hear from uh, um, uh, Professor uh, Ponciano? Yes, of course. So I believe the primary message that uh, my colleague sent uh, was uh, to evaluate uh, the cost-benefit ratio. So that's why I believe that uh, we need uh, a tiered approach when you do a prioritization for cancer treatment. So we need uh, at least uh, to develop specific recommendation for cancer patient treatment during the COVID-19 pandemics. We know that the situation is rapidly evolving. We know that we need the pragmatic action and we have to deal uh, with the challenges of treating patients, ensuring their rights, their safety and their well-being. So in my opinion, I believe it's quite important to define what is a high priority, what is a medium priority, and what is a low priority. And all of these priorities should balance, of course, the potential benefit of treatment, so curative intent or palliative intent, should also consider the patient comorbidities and age. It was very nice, the presentation and the focus on elderly population. And finally, you should also look uh, at, the, at the outcome that you can achieve with that specific treatment. So is that therapy impacting on overall survival in progression free survival? Is, is this just a palliative treatment? We tried with the, with the European Society for Medical Oncology to develop some specific uh, uh, recommendations that are based on this type of priorities. 
And so we define that the high priority as a patient condition that is immediately life threatening or clinical unstable, or for whom the magnitude of clinical benefit deriving from a specific treatment may impact on survival. Then we have a medium priority, so patients that you can delay for treatment because there is finally no impact on overall survival or no need for palliation of a specific symptom, so the patient is not clinically unstable. And finally, we have low priority. In this case, patients on follow-up, patients on endocrine therapy or targeted agents with, with the disease that is stable. In my country, we define two different types of patients. The first one is the category of patients on active treatment because there is an active cancer that should be treated. And in this case, uh, we define it as something like hub hospitals. I mean, cancer hospitals where we don't take care of COVID patients. The experience in my hospital, we have a small COVID unit with just eight beds that is reserved for patients under treatment who will develop COVID during treatment. But uh, in Regione Lombardia, we have all the other hospitals that are COVID hospitals. So I mean, if a patient of wine during treatment will develop an ARDS related to COVID, she will be or he will be transferred to another hospital. So that's why we tried in my hospital to maintain a COVID-free pathway in order to guarantee access to care to any cancer patients from the other hospitals that are overwhelmed, of course, for treatment of COVID patients. So the, the, the reason why we decided to do this is first to guarantee access to care. So think about all the surgery. In many hospitals, surgery has been stopped because you have so many, so many COVID patients that you cannot take care of them. So in my hospital, if a patient from another hospital has been diagnosed with the cancer, will come here, will be tested for COVID. If negative, will get surgery. And the same thing for adjuvant therapies for any type of disease and also for metastatic disease. In the Spock hospital, of course, you treat COVID patients, but if you have cancer patients newly diagnosed or need to continue standard of care, will come to the hub hospital. It's a reorganization that was very easy in a small region of 11 million people like Regione Lombardia, but it is working because in my hospital, we have, we have a very limited number of patients that are COVID positive. Okay, that, that's good. Uh, thank you very much um, for this comment. So, so we'll, we'll take some of the questions um, from the, the audience. Uh, thank you for writing the questions if you have it. But uh, going to the, uh, to the Prof. Uh, Foncia, uh, uh, is, is did you have you know, what is your experience with a virtual management, virtual clinic? So did you switch all your patients to virtual clinic? Um, you know, and uh, what is the experience with that? What do you do, for example, uh, with, um, you've told us about the lab that, you know, you can do it in a hospital that uh, probably closer to their home and doesn't have COVID-19 cases. But what about the medication? If patients in oral medication, do you ship medications? So please, can you reflect on the experience with the virtual clinic uh, to, the, to the audience, please? Uh, absolutely. Thank you very much for your question. Obviously, we are moving forward a virtual scenario with our cancer patient. It means that we are currently arranging uh, online visits using different platforms, even in our EMR. We have our own platform for arranging with our patients video calls, uh, video consultations. So it's a very, very useful. Obviously, it means and the main purpose that we are pursuing is to reduce the number of hospital visits. On the other hand, obviously, very often, our patients require any lab or imaging assessment. And for this purpose, we are trying 
to use external facility where we can arrange these kind of assessments. Obviously, uh, patients that require any medications. So uh, usually we're shipping medications to patient home and we have a video call for explaining the side events and as well for controlling uh, symptom management and to be sure that they are taking correctly the medications. Uh, however, we have some patients that we need to see in our institutions, but we try to reduce the number of hospital visits and to do exactly the minimum visit and only those visits that are only necessary for the patients. We are following quite similar approach uh, for the patients in clinical trials. Obviously, uh, we need to include in the assessment, in the workup of any cancer patient potentially eligible or ongoing in any clinical trial, COVID analysis to be sure if the patients could be positive or negative. So that's something that we are completely changing our uh, usual approach to patients to these new virtual consultations that is very useful and that's something that we can do very easily currently with all the platforms available uh, on internet. Uh, that's great. Thank you very much. We will be uh, lumping some of the questions, you know, later on. Um, and uh, for those of you who ask questions we did not, we could not uh, catch up with, you will be seeing the answers hopefully in the uh, COVID-19 Resource Center in, in ASCO. But because of the sake of the time, let's move on for the second talk. And I, I introduced already Dr. Gossip, and he's going to talk to us about strategy uh, to um, re reduce the risk on staff. As you know, staff are frontline individuals in, uh, in managing uh, these patients, and the, the, they are exposed to a risk, a significant risk, whether it's a risk of infection or um, exhaustion or burnout or emotional uh, issues. So it's very critical that we take care of them uh, properly. Uh, Gossip, uh, the microphone is yours. Okay, thanks a lot. So we try to understand what we did specifically in my hospital in order to minimize the risk to staff and of course to reorganize the, the health system according to this hub and Fox network. So um, which are the general strategies that we adopted in Italy? Of course, uh, we had uh, three different communities. Uh, communities with no confirmed cases, because of course not all Italy is pandemic. And in this case, the first strategy was prevention for imports. So the country is all in lockdown, but we know that there are many communities in which there is no confirmed case. And we need community mobilization, health education, information, management of returning personnel from the epidemic areas, in preparation of supplies. Then we have communities with confirmed cases or outbreaks. We are also discussing about hospitals. You know, uh, when you have an emergency room where you have access of uh, hundreds of patients per day, that is a community with the confirmed cases also in the health professionals. And uh, we did exactly prevention from spreading in the community and exporting the epidemics, consider the doctors and the health professional becoming positive and exporting the virus in family. So management of close contacts was very important in these infections. And of course, we had a lot of communities with spreading of epidemics. And in this case, of course, we need a lockdown. So also the idea of closing the access to new patients. So this is the reorganization in a spoke and app network. So Regione Badia is the most, uh, is the largest region in, in Italy in terms of habitants. It's located here in the north of Italy. And uh, of course, actually, we had a lot of cases uh, in Bergamo, Brescia, Lecco, Como, but the three hubs hospital from Milano that were the National Cancer Institute, the European Institute of Oncology, 
and the Humanitas Cancer Center are receiving patients from Brescia, Lecco, Sondrio, Como, Varese, and Pavia. It means that for the other regions with a lot of cases, Bergamo, Cremona, and Lodi, that were the first red zones in Italy, there are other heart hospitals. This system is actually working. So if uh, any new patients will be diagnosed with cancer in one of the spots, they send us uh, an ECRF and we will take care of these new patients. We will uh, test them for COVID, and if negative, we will take care of them in a COVID-free environment. So what about uh, uh, the hierarchy of controls? So, uh, of course, we need the general infection prevention and control measures, and we adapted exactly in, the, in my hospital what has been done by the, the, the WHO. So, uh, uh, of course, the use of personal protective equipment and the isolation of any health professional suspected to be positive. So what to do? First of all, training of the current COVID-19 epidemiological situation. So every week we do a retraining of the health professional in order to understand which are the risk factors for infection, which is the epidemiology actually in the Milan region, in Lombardia region and in Italy, and then perform a checkpoint of care risk assessment. So outside the hospital, there is a checkpoint that will take body temperature, and we do a triage of patients by telephone. So every day, we contact all the patients that should come in the hospital the day after, to understand if they have symptoms that are suspect. So we are ready to receive those patients and to test them and to avoid them to enter in the hospital. So the general infection prevention is, uh, first of all, due to the likelihood of virus transmission by persons with few or no symptoms. So stop the, the I, I am moving the slides, so I will take care of them. So what is important is to remember that we need to implement physical distancing by staff, visitors, and patients. So no visitor is entering in the hospital up now, just the patients. And we are using surgical masks for healthcare workers, for the personal protection, also administrative personnel, and also for patients that are coming here. So are they working or not? This is a paper published on Nature Medicine one week ago. And you can see here that here, the surgical masks have been used just to understand if they can prevent coronavirus, influenza virus, or rhinovirus. And they really works to protect. So it means that if you wear a surgical mask, you will protect not yourself, but the other people because you reduce the spreading of the virus. So the message is that the surgical mask is the best way to protect the other people, not to protect yourself. But if anyone is wearing a surgical mask, of course everyone will be protected, at least the first level of protection. So anyone in the hospital that is taking care of COVID negative patients, at least negative because they have no symptoms. So it's a, it's a surgical mask that is not intended to protect the wearer, but is intended to protect the other people. So my, our first advice is please, anyone should wear a surgical mask. Then we have a second level of protection. This is for health professionals that are doing invasive procedures. So pneumologists working in doing bronchoscopy or bronchial alveolar lavage, surgeons that are working with the lung cancer patients or with other type of cancer patients. And we have two types of masks, FFP2 and FFP3. And these are professional masks because here, there is really a very limited chance to transmit the virus. But in the context 
of FFP2 and FFP3, we have mask with valves and without valves. So don't forget that if you wear a mask with valve, you need also to wear the surgical mask. So because the most protective one is without valves. So nobody needs to wear this type of valves in the hospital. These type of masks are only for doctors that are doing invasive procedures in which there is really a risk of contamination. Just to tell you that in my hospital, the only doctors that were positive for COVID-19 are pneumologists doing a bronchoscopy without appropriate protection, without FFP2 and FFP3. And they contracted the virus before the lockdown. So it's very important to know this. If you have a suspected case of COVID-19, we isolated him or we separated him from the other patients. We generated a COVID unit in my hospital. They should wear a surgical mask if available, or at least, or at least they should cover their mouth with a tissue. Non-essential contacts between suspected cases should be minimized. So we restricted the non-essential uh, visits. We generated in our hospital a COVID-19 preparedness and response committee. Of course, there was the chief medical hospital. And then there was uh, an expert uh, in uh, reanimation, so an expert in intensive care and some infectivologists and pneumologists. So it's very important to have, a, let's say, a crisis unit in the hospital. In terms of administrative measures, so you need to identify and designate additional separate unit that can be used for diagnostic evaluation and treatment of COVID-19. So in our COVID-19 unit, we have a specific doctors and nurses that will have no other contact with the other patients. Of course, they should wear a personal protective equipment, and we should have also lab capacities and therapeutics to include these estimates. Of course, we should be also in the charge to do the testing and the management and the follow-up of healthcare working, uh, workers with respiratory symptoms, because you know in Italy, many healthcare wor workers in the COVID hospitals have been tested positive, so we have to minimize this in our hospital. So all staff with symptoms is isolated. So if, uh, if you develop symptoms in the hospital, of course you are tested, but you go home, and you have to stay home for two or three weeks, then you come back again in the hospital, you will be tested twice, one time and the second time, and if two tests are negative on RT-PCR, you can come back to work. So it's quite important to isolate as soon as possible any type of healthcare worker that has symptoms or that has been tested positive. So, we have limited patients, of course, and uh, usually if the patients are mild symptomatics, they send, uh, we send them home, and in case they have, a, we do telemedicine in order to understand if they have worsening of the symptoms, and uh, if there is a worsening of the symptoms, they should go in a COVID hospital. This is very important, I believe. So uh, staff providing care to COVID-19 patients should be also be active and follow up for development of symptoms, even if they have any type of health uh, professional equipment because they are really very well protected. But we need to understand that if the healthcare workers exposed to COVID-19 cases in our hospital uh, uh, even if using the personal protective equipment have any type of symptoms, they have to stop work, they have to do a self-monitoring, and to have, uh, they have to be self-quarantined. This, uh, this is very important to maintain a, 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 a COVID-free hospital. So this staff uh, should wear, of course, uh, scrubs, 
for the duration of their work, they should wear special shoes, they should wear the maximum level of personal protective equipment, so FFP2 and FFP3, and should consider regulatory cleaning and disinfection with electronic equipment. So, of course, uh, we need really to be sure that they are free of COVID. So, staff managing COVID-19 should consider also a practical physical distancing with the other staff, wash hands frequently, a clean uh, frequent touch surfaces, and, uh, you know, in, in Regional Lombardia, we decided that uh, the people working with COVID-19, we generated for them some facilities. So, some hotel in Milan, actually, there is no hotel for tourists, uh, is available for health professionals that would like to go there and, of course, to protect their families. So, in order to reduce uh, the risk of spreading of the virus outside the hospital. So, in terms of personal protection, we had a, a, a first level, outpatient clinic and ordinary wars with disposable caps, surgical mask, usually the, the surgical mask, working clothes and disposable latex clothes. Then we have second level, that is for the COVID hospital, so a fever clinic with disposable caps and any type of protection. And then isolation areas and lab staff. As I say to you, in my hospital, we have this small COVID unit with just uh, eight beds. And for the health professional working here, that is a single staff and single nurses, so there are very few people work here, we have the maximum protection for them. So thank you very much. If you have any question, I will be very happy to take. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, he says we have only a couple of minutes to comment from, uh, from you before we take a couple of questions from the participant. Do you have anything to say uh, on what we heard? Yes, uh, thank you very much. So physical protection is clearly a must, but we are facing an unprecedented nightmare scenario, and we need to take care very, very carefully the global well-being of our health personnel, including the psychological impact. So during this time, it's only natural that healthcare staff could enter a state of acute stress. We have a duty both to ourselves and to our colleagues and to reduce its chronicity and its insidious impact on our own well-being as healthcare staff. So I'm wondering is there anything I could do to promote the mental well-being of my colleagues or my trainees? And most importantly, is there anything I need to focus on for my own well-being? So it's important in these times to foster an open culture of trust and understanding amongst one another. And it's as well vital that we work to promote resilience in our colleagues and particularly in our trainees, especially with the current social environment may hinder the development of resilient attributes. Resilience could be defined as the interactive and dynamic process of adapting, managing, and negotiating adversity. So furthermore, some research has suggested that feeling of empowerment and of belonging may help to promote resilience. So obviously, we need to think about the whole well-being of our colleagues, our health person. And let me finish with that sentence from Nelson Mandela. Don't judge me by my success, judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. Thank you very much. Thank you. That, that's great. So actually, you know, one of the questions that, you know, came from the audience is about uh, the emotional support and well-being. Are there any practical things you are doing, uh, Gossip, in your institution to support your staff? This is the only question we'll take. For the other <laughs> colleagues who ask questions, you will, you will, you will find your answers in the, in the um, uh, ASCO resource centers, and also we have subsequent webinars that will cover many of the topics you have asked about. Gossip? Yes, as, uh, as Jesus said, of course, uh, burnout uh, and resilience uh, should be the backbone of all this situation. You know, any one of us uh, 
also had a family member that died to COVID-19. In my hospital, we have a, a psychology unit, actually. They are sending us uh, a, an online survey in which we answer to specific questions. And then finally, there is a, a distress score. And in case you need assistance, uh, you know, you can call and you can discuss with the psychologist. To tell you, um, many of the doctors actually are so uh, involved in management uh, of the pandemics and the cancer patients that sometimes don't have time to, to do this, to, do, to, to ask for a psychological support. But I can tell you that many young doctors uh, had the real signs of burnout. So I believe uh, psychological support uh, and resilience uh, is quite important to manage the situation. Maybe not in our hospital, the Tarhab hospital, but in big COVID hospital, uh, the situation is really extreme. Okay. Okay. Th thank you very much for our uh, distinguished speakers. You know, I would. Um, you know, again, remind everybody that you can find, uh, you know, the, the the resource center. You know, many of the questions actually they were asked. Actually, there are answers in them. You know, they came uh, in the past, and we discussed them in detail. So please look at, look it up, and then look at the future uh, post that we'll put there because you know we'll address some of the questions. Um, now, Doug, is the the stage is yours to do the wrap up. No, thank you, Dr. Jassy, uh, our panelists, and all of you for joining us on this webinar. We hope what you have heard today will help make a difficult time a little bit easier. You know, ASCO is a global community, and we all need to learn from each other, and we hope that you've learned something today. We hope you will join us for our next webinar at the same time, 8 o'clock Eastern, on April 21st. And recordings of this session will also be made available on the ASCO website. And we also encourage you, as Dr. Jazzy mentioned, to continue to visit the ASCO website, uh, the coronavirus website, for additional resources, which will be updated. And just thank you for your time, and please stay safe.